Okay. So hopefully some more people start trickling in, but other than that, we can get started. Okay. This is the long session. I'm pretty sure it's session seven actually, but yeah, welcome to session seven of, of introduction to Java. And today we're going to be doing some more um, object oriented programming, which is, we haven't done that yet. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's pretty special. It's pretty cool. So we'll get started with that. Okay. So we can start off with an icebreaker. Anything fun this weekend? Anything anybody's looking forward to? Do you guys play any video games? No, yes, maybe. No to the fun things this weekend or no to the video games? Uh, Yeah, my parents used to ban video games too, but then I just like stopped wanting to play them because there wasn't time. <laughs> okay. Assuming that no one has any other anything else to offer. <laughs> okay, so no one no, that's good. <laughs> Okay, so the first problem, what's the widest, if you guys remember anything from last unit or like not unit, last session of random numbers, do you guys remember how next int works and stuff like that? If not, I can just explain it today, but hopefully you do. So first one, what is the possible range of numbers generated by this code? So you see that we create an object called random and its name is rand. And then we do rand.nextInt and we have a bound of 10. So does anyone have a guess for what's the range of possible values for this? Any guesses for the first one? If not, that's fine. Okay, so the first one, you can experiment with it on your own, but basically it's going to give you a number from zero to nine, including zero and nine. And it doesn't go up to 10 because the bound is the maximum. It's not going to actually hit 10. So it's never going to be 10. So yeah. Okay. Second one, knowing that the first, one, okay. Second one's a bit complicated actually, my bad. But knowing that the first one is from zero to nine, can someone tell me what the lowest possible value of num is? So we see that once again, we created a new rand, a new random object. And then we did int num is equal to this random next int from zero to nine minus two. Ooh, these are some interesting guesses. Okay, so, okay, so you see here, um, some of you are close. Okay, so you see here that you have num is equal to next int and then it's zero to nine and then it's minus two. So your guess of negative two is actually correct if you only consider the first one. But yeah, whoever just said three is right because you see here, the lowest possible value we'll get from next in is zero. And then when we subtract two from that, the lowest possible value for num is negative two, but then we have to add whatever, whatever this is. So you see the lowest possible value here is zero, but then we add five. So negative two plus five, that's three. So yeah, good job. Num is equal to three. Good job, good job. And then for the last one, what is the possible range of values for num for the variable called number? This is pretty simple. If you remember what next double does, it's pretty simple. If you don't, then it's fine. Double? <laughs> it is a double. Um, okay, so here, let me just show you actually, because I feel like it's good to have a visual of this. Let me just show my screen. Okay, so you see here, we have ignored this. We'll get to that in a sec. So if we just do a new random and then, um, if we just do next double, here, let's print it out actually so you guys can see it. Oh. 
Okay, so there you go. And you see that it, auto, it automatically imported the Venom library. So knowing this, if we just run this program, here we go. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so we have whatever this obscene number is. And the reason we have that is because it, just like you said, gives us a uh, double. So you see, if you look at documentation, it returns the next pseudo random double. It's a double between zero and one. And even if you have an IDE, like if you just do code, you can just like kind of hover over these methods and then they give you all this text and explanation. And then it's really, actually, it's actually super helpful to understand what that does. And if you are not like completely clear, then you can just hover over it and you can see. So the possible range of values is from 0, 0.0 to 1.0 for this one. I don't think it goes up to one point. I don't think it goes up to one actually. Let me check. Uh, it does not go up to one. Yeah, so it's one is exclusive here, if you can tell. Okay. So next thing. Oh, next bit of a view. What is the range of possible values of number? Okay, so this one's a bit complicated if you just take a glance at it, but then the logic becomes pretty simple. So what's the range of possible values for number? First of all, what is what can number be? Close. It's so the range of possible values for number is going to have to be nine because I'm talking about I'm talking about random dot next int. I'm not talking about the if statements because that's for something else. So it's like, what's the possible? What are the possible values that we have stored in number at this point on this line? Smaller than six is close, but it's actually going to be smaller, smaller than nine. So it goes from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's the possible values for that. That means that you can have nine different numbers for this one. And if you put it up to 10, um, it would actually go from zero all the way up to 10. I mean, it go up to nine, including nine, but because it includes zero, then you would have 10 numbers there. So here you have nine possible numbers for number, I guess, and then it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 9. Okay, so this program is intended to do something. Can someone tell me what this code is going to print out? Um, does it print out rock, paper, and scissors with equal probability? Yeah, 0 to 8 inclusive is the right answer for that. Okay, for the second one, do you guys think that it prints out rock, paper, scissors with the same probability for each choice? So if you had a computer playing rock, paper, scissors against you, would you choose a certain answer? Would you choose to go rock, paper, or scissors more than something else to win more often because it would be completely random? What do you guys think? Okay, so if you said yes, then you'd be correct. I see that earlier you said like you thought it was less than six, but here it's just, I'm just saying here with the if statements that if the number is less than three, it's going to print out rock, which is because the number from, is from zero up to eight. So zero, one, and two, that's three possible values. It's going to print out rock. If it's less than six, we have an else if here actually. So it's going to be three, four, and five. That's three values once again. So three out of nine, that's a one third chance once again. So the first one's one third, last one's one third. And then the else, everything else is um, six, seven, eight. So that's also one third. So this program here actually would print out rock, paper, scissors, shoe. Well, not shoe, but rock, paper, scissors with the same probability for each one. So yeah, that's that. Okay, last one. <laughs> I mean, not last one, but can you guys tell me how many times this prints out hello world? I don't expect you to actually remember this. 
unless um, we might have to review do while loops a little bit, but does anyone know how many times it printed out? Ooh, three. Yes, actually, it does print it out three times. It goes, so let's just go through it in our heads. It is, yeah, it is three times. You read the first time. So it goes, hello world, when i is equal to zero. It prints it out again when i is, I is equal to one because is you hear that you add one to i, you increment it. And because one is still less than three, it prints it out again. So that's your second time. And then you add one, you add one to i again. This time i to, goes to two. And then because i is still less than three, it goes back to the top, prints it out again. That's your third time. But then you have to add to i again, and i is going to become three. And three isn't less than three, so the while loop doesn't keep going. So yeah, three times. Good job. Okay. So, so here's some more, here's some more of a view. I didn't want to ask us the question because I don't think you guys would have like remembered the specific like syntax or the method name. I don't I don't even remember it because I don't use files that much. But so this is the code for creating a file. I just wanted to review it, go through it again. So first we have you see here we have a file created called my object. So file my object is a new file. And then we have to give the path name. It's this path name here in the IDE. Um, it might show that for you, it might not. It started showing up that, it started showing that to me randomly out of nowhere. So you have to give it the path name, file name.txt. And then, so the reason that we have an if statement here is because when we call my object that create new file, when we make it an actual file inside of our computer, if it already exists, then it gives us a false. So basically if it's a false, we go to else and we say the file already exists. And if it's a true, then we can just say some out that print line and then we can say like, oh, the file was created. And here we have like my object dot get name, which is just like the standard for like getting the name of the file. It would, I think it would give you file name that txt because this is the file name up here, right? So yeah, that's pretty simple. That's how we created a new file. And then here's some bit, Here's a bit more of you for how to write files and read from files. So we see here, we have to use a new object called file writer to actually put text onto the file. Once again, we have to tell what the file is. We have to tell the computer where the file is, what the file is, all that. So file name that txt again, and then we do the writer, we write down whatever this text is. Yeah, I can now write to the file and then we can close it. So that's just how that works, pretty simple. Once again, we have to use the file writer. You can't just say like file here because I don't think file supports its own like dot write method. And we'll get into all this object stuff today. So don't worry if you think, if you were like wondering like, oh, why doesn't it do that? And all that stuff. And here, this is reading from the file. So we create a file object, file my second object. And then we, we tell the file and then what's the same as we created the file. We have to say, oh, where the file is, what's the file's name, all that stuff. And then this is the special part. So when you're inputting anything in Java, a lot of the time you're gonna have to use a scanner. So you can just say, oh, scanner in my reader is equal to a new scanner in my second object. So the name of the scanner is called my reader. And then the, it's a scanner that you have to create a new scanner and you have to give it my second object. So the reason you have to give it this object is because you have to tell the scanner, oh, this is the file that we're scanning. Earlier when we were doing user input, we did like new scanner and then we put in their system.in. So it was taking in the system terminal input, but now it's through a file. So it's, we have to pass in a file object. So yeah, that's great. And then this part, this part's kind of interesting to me. <laughs> Here we have a while loop and we say, oh, while my reader has the next line, this is a pretty useful part of scanners. With scanners, you have this method to tell you true or false, does, do we still have more lines left in the file to look at, to scan? And then if we do, then it just like adds the next line to a string and then we can print out the string. So yeah, that's basically all there is. And also the reason that we need a while loop here and with this has next line thing is because if you try to do next line when there's no lines left for the scanner to look at, the computer's gonna freak out and die. So don't do that. Always try to use a while loop with dot has next line. Scanners are super useful. I love scanners. Okay, 
schedule this week. This might look a little bit uh, spiced. It might look a little bit weird, but the only thing we're going to be doing this week, this session is going to be your, an introduction to OOP, so object-oriented programming, and we'll be covering these classes and objects today. So I also, uh, what's it called? Next week, we'll, next week actually will be the last session of this introduction course because we basically covered a lot of the intro stuff, all the basic stuff. If we go, if we go any deeper, it's going to be hard to follow, and you're going to need to do a lot of practice and learning on your own. So, next week's going to be the last session, and we're going to be wrapping all this OOP stuff up. We'll be wrapping up the introduction that we start with today. Okay, so introduction to OOP. Does anyone already know what it is? Have any idea of what OOP is? Object oriented programming. Does anyone, does anyone know what that means? Basically, it's basically programming in a language where everything is an object and every object can be modified. Yeah, that's actually really good. That is a good answer. It's like you said. It's a programming. It's programming where you center around objects and classes. And yeah, it is related to programming. It's like. It's a not really style. I think I've I've heard it described as a philosophy of programming. But here's your OOP description. Okay, OOP stands for Object Oriented Programming. Now, from that name, you can already tell kind of what it's about. And essentially, it's an approach to programming that centers on objects and classes. And they kind of are what they sound like. They're you have an ob an object could be say a cup, and then a class could be the class of the object could be, I guess it'll be cup, and then the object would be like an actual physical cup. So yeah, it is what it, it, it is what it sounds like, and we'll discuss what all that actually means in a sec. And objects are things that have variables and define behaviors. So what does that mean? So say for example, uh, we look at this actual cup. This cup has a has a variable. Let's say it's the diameter of the cup, and then of the opening, and then it could have another variable of like how hard the ceramic is. I don't know how to make these. I just spilled water on my keyboard. Give me a sec. Okay, I'm good. But yeah, so that could be a variable. And then it could also have defined behaviors, which is like a behavior of this cub. I guess the cub wouldn't have behaviors, but if you had say like a cat or a dog, that behavior could be like bark or meow or jump. You know, all that stuff. That's all that's all a behavior, and we'll discuss what that actually means in a sec. Okay. Moving on. So before we talk about anything in terms of like objects, we have to make a class. To make an object, we need a class. So what are classes? Well, we've created classes in the past. Basically, just use the class keyword. So here, class, it's in blue, and then you give it a name. So the class I made here was called example class. And also you have to be careful when you say public class. We'll discuss what public means next week, but essentially you can only have one public class in each file. You can have multiple classes, but you can only use the word public class once in each file. Also, it has to match the actual file name. So public class, example class, you can't see it here, but I named my file example class.java. So that's how that works. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And then here, um, I don't think I actually meant to do all this slightly more complex stuff here, but essentially we have one attribute of this class, number, num, and then we have the main method. We've dealt a lot with the main method already. We've done everything in the main method. Uh, so in main, basically we created a new object of this class and then we print it out. I'll, I'll discuss all that in depth. Okay. So that's our example class. And before we proceed further and go on and go on to objects, what does it mean to have a class versus having an object? So now that we have a class, to actually use it, uh, we often need to actually make an object of that class. So what is an object? What's that difference? Well, a class is basically a template for an object. I was saying this earlier, but a class basically defines the properties of the object, um, the valid set of data values it could have, the default values of the object, stuff like that. And an object, is called an instance of a class. That's what it's called in programmer talk, I guess. That's the term for it. It's an instance. And you also need to create an object from a class. So that's if you don't have a class, you can't make an object. That's just not how it works. You need you need a class to make an object. Going back to the analogy we had earlier, if we had this cup, 
this is an object, right? I'm holding it in my hand. It's physically here. It's one thing. It's an object. Now, what would the class be for this cup? Well, um, I guess you could say because it's a template that the class would be um, the blueprint for making something like this, like whatever they, I don't know how they make cups. So the blueprint, the whatever instructions surround making it, that's what is the class. And when you have a class from that class, from the information in that class, you can create an object and I'll show what that looks like. So here's an object, creating an object. So we see here to create a class, do class name, object name. Oh, I guess it's supposed to say create an object, my bad. So class name, object name, a, and then new class name. So here of class is called, wait, I didn't create the frog, but here's an example class. You see here, it's the name of the class is example class. And then we do example class. We do the name of this object. So from now on, the object is going to be called sample example, I mean. And then we do dot, I mean, equals new example class. So basically, essentially, new example class is how we create a new object. So new class name is how we create an object. After we create this object, we have to save it in a variable, which is what this is. This is the variable. It's a variable of type example class. And then you save it in that. And if you guys want to think about it, when we go back to when we discussed primitive data types and strings and integers and all that, I did say that you can also have your, a class be a type. And that's exactly what's happening here. Here, the class example class is the type of the variable. It's the type of um, the object called example. So hopefully you understood that. It's a little convoluted, but yeah. You have to choose the object name. You, you get, I mean, you get to choose the object name. It can be named whatever you want. And then the class name depends on which class you want the object to be an instance of. So if you want to create a um, object of type of from the class frog, then you would do frog example equals to new frog. So it all depends on which class you want to create the object from. And then finally, don't forget to use the new keyword. That's right here, new in pink, and then the parentheses at the end. So yeah, that's how you create a new object. I'll give you guys a few seconds to look at that code. Okay, moving on. Oh, we have an exercise. Okay, so everybody try to right now in either JDoodle, I guess, or your own IDE, Visual Studio Code, hopefully, hopefully, create your own class called dog and then just create an object of dog. Don't do anything else with it. I mean, you can do some exploring if you already know what, what OOP is and some of the concepts, but just make your own class called dog and then create an object with it. And I'll give you guys like five minutes to do that or well, a few minutes and then I'll show how to do it.
Okay. So hopefully that was enough time. If not, I'm sorry, but I'm going to sort of show it now. So to create a class, like I said, we need to use the class keyword. So the word class, class, dog, and then these brackets to show what's inside of it. And then we don't really have to do anything else. I guess I'll make a string name equals to what's a good dog's name. Uh, isn't, isn't there one like famous one called Toto or something? I forgot. Okay. So we'll do dog, um, my dog. I don't have a dog, sadly, but, and then that's it. So that's how you create an object. And then if we just run the program, it's not gonna actually do anything. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. It's pretty boring. But if you wanted to print out the name, actually, I think I was gonna save this for later. So I won't do that now. So yeah, you use the class keyword and then you give the name and then you don't have to do any, you don't have to actually put this line. I just did it. And then you can make a new object of that class. New dog, new for new object, dog for the class name. And then you have to save this object that you just created inside of a variable called my dog. And yeah, it's pretty simple. Don't forget that main method is the only one that's actually gonna execute. Okay. So that out of the way, classes and objects. So here's a bit more on classes and objects and like the nuances of using them. So you can actually make multiple objects from the same class. Notice how in this, um, we have two frogs being created, two different frogs, Tim and Jim. I don't think there's any difference between them in tongue length because they both have tongue length of 10. But essentially, uh, you can notice how the name uh, of the object dot name of variable is used to access it. So, oh, this is tongue length, not name, but yeah. And then if you guys wanna test this code out, you basically just, both of these should print 10. So yes, here we can actually see that. I'll do it here because I guess I created the name of the dog anyways. So I'll do some dot out dot print line and then we can just say, uh, what's the name of my dog, right? So dog dot name. Let's print that out. It's a string. We can just print it out. Save this one. It. Oh, there we go. It's total. So yeah. And then if we create multiple dogs, so we say dog, uh, her dog. Let's go to new dog. And then we do system dot out dot print line. Uh, uh, her dog dot name. So once again, you see how we're using the name of the object and then the name of the attribute we want to look at. And we'll discuss what all of this is in a sec. And puts out total twice because you see how both times the default value for name was total. So yeah. Okay, attributes. I've already shown you what an attribute looks like. It's just the total was an attribute of that class, but essentially it's just a variable that's inside of a class or an object. And when the variable is a part of a class, they're called attributes. And here you see three attributes, right? These are the three. Can anyone tell me what the names of these three different attributes are? It's pretty obvious, I think. Name and value. If not, that's fine. It's pretty obvious in my opinion, but it's like the name here, we have an integer attribute age and then the value is 12 and then the string attribute called name. And then the value here is Jimmy. I don't know why I named the frog Jimmy. And then last one is tongue length, which is just 10. Okay. So it's pretty simple. And then we get to modifying and accessing attributes. Okay. This one. You can access the attribute of an object by doing object name, and then you do like the variable name, dot variable name, and you can directly modify the attribute of the object using that. So what is this, uh, can someone tell me what this program prints out? Does anyone have any ideas?
Okay, if not, then we'll just go through it together. So you see that we have an example class and then we do a new object of this example class from this template. And we say it's called example. And then we say print out example.num. So first example, uh, the object example, and then the attributes value is five. So this would print out five. And then if we do example.num again, but we set it to equal to 10 this time. So it's kind of like what we had with arrays, how you can directly set them and access them. This time we set it equal to 10. And then we say, we print out the example.num again, and this time it's gonna print out 10. So let me just show that really quickly. If I do say, if I just do my dog, but I change my dog's name, because I don't like the name Toto. I actually do like the name Toto, but let's just change it anyways. Let's change it to Jack. And then we print it out. You can just see that once again, even though we're looking at the dog's name, we actually were able to change the attribute here. So instead of being Toto again, this time it prints out Jack. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And here, if you guys want to check it out. Uh, yeah, this actually doesn't let me can set it equal to an int. So I do have to use a name of Jack. So yeah, it's always important that even if you're changing it, you can't change the type. It's going, always going to be of type string. So you can't change it from Jack to say like one or two. You should never name your dog one or two. Okay, so. Yay, exercise. So try to create a class with dog that's an integer attribute of 10, um, and then just create an object of that class and then print out the um, integer attribute of 10. So print, it should print out 10 ideally. And then after, you, after you're done with that, make another object with of the class dog. But before you actually print anything out, I want you to subtract five from age. Yeah, from up here, it's supposed to say age, but make it age and then you print out the age. And then this time the value should be different because you subtracted five before you printed it. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to do that.
Okay, so hopefully that was enough time. I'll demonstrate it to you now. Uh, okay, so here we go. What's next again? Oh yeah, so dialog with integer, integer app attribute age of 10, and then you make an um, object of that class and then print it out and you do it again, but subtract five. Okay, so let's see. Dog, we're gonna just do int age equals to five and then wait 10. And then we can make a, we can create a new dog, my dog, and then we can say, Once again, we say the object name and then the name of the attribute. And we can just do my dog, um, other dog, send new dog, blah, blah, blah. And then once again, here, let me just print it out without subtracting this time. So it's going to be okay. 10, 10. Yeah, that's pretty easy. And then, but this time, let's do dot age and then we subtract five before we actually print anything out. This time it just goes like ten to five. Okay, so that's pretty simple. It's just showing you. It's just showing you that like when you are modifying these variables, you actually do change the variable of that object itself. And if there's any confusion, I'll print it out once more. But this time I'll print out my dog again. So you see that it's not actually changing the value of my dog. It's changing the value of her dog. So only her dog is getting five years younger. My dog is the same. It's still ten years old. And then it's so you, these two are two different objects. They're two different, they have two different values. There's two different ages of these two dogs. Okay. So one last thing is that um, when you're cha changing variables, changing the values of these variables like this is actually not a good practice at all. If possible, try not to ever do this. Just straight up say dot whatever the variable it is and then change it. That's always bad. So I'll show a better way to do it next week or this week if we have time. Okay, back to exercise, after PowerPoint. Okay, so methods in a class. Methods, um, we've already learned what methods are, right? Functions, methods, same thing. It's like pieces of code and functionality that you can call upon whenever you need to, and it simplifies your code. It can be used over and over again, all that good stuff. So methods here, methods can be created inside of a class, and these methods basically decide what the object's behavior is. So you see that we have like, print tongue length and then if we call it it prints out the tongue length so the reason that we have it inside of this class is so that it sees the tongue length and it prints it out if this had private in front of it then we only could only print it out by calling a method but it doesn't have public or private in front of it and i'll discuss what public and private mean more in detail next week okay so yeah, methods in a class is pretty simple and when you call these methods that you put inside of a class it's essentially the same as calling a, as accessing a variable, except you want to um, say method name and then parentheses. And of course, instead of these parentheses, if it's, if you're not required to pass in any parameters, it's going to be blank. But if you are, then um, you do have to put parameters in and values in so that you can call this method. And it's going to be object name dot method name once again. And so, can anyone tell me what this code prints out right here? This one. Any ideas? No, nothing. So if you want to see here, we created a flag that we'll call bofog. So it's an equals to new flag. And then we say bofog.print tongue length. So it basically it calls the method print tongue length inside of this class bodog, I mean bofog. And then this method right here, it takes the tongue length, which is set to be 10 for these objects, takes the tongue length and it prints it out. So yeah, there you go. And then Okay, once again, another exercise. I want you guys to try to practice with this stuff as possible. So we essentially add a string attribute called name to the flag class and then set it equal to bofog. 
So earlier we had the bow file class, but it didn't have a string attribute called name. And then here you add a method to the file class, which prints out the name of it. And then lastly, you create a new flag object and you call the method that prints out the name. So add the attribute, add the method, and then uh, call the method to test it out. And it's basically, it's the exact same as what we had with age, but this time with the string and I just want to practice with it yourself.
Okay. So hopefully that was enough time. I'll just show how to do it now. And then let me give you a sec. Uh, stand for you. Name call close. Dog. Okay. So we have, let's change this to a frog instead of a dog. We have a string name, oops. Bullfrog, blah, blah. And we can basically just say, Okay, I'm just putting out the name and then I wanted to, yeah, that's it actually. So let's make, delete all this stuff, make it a frog. So, uh, hermit, I don't think hermit's a bow frog, but uh, that's more about that later. Okay, so we print out, we just have to call the method, right? So it's hermit dot hermit's name and then that should ideally print it out for us. Yay, he's a bow frog. Okay, you know what? I think more fittingly, we'd have this as bow frog than this as hermit. Okay, so the bow frog's name is hermit. There we go. And going back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so static versus non-static. I also wanted to talk about what that meant, even though we've seen it and use it um, Kermit? Oh, I meant Kermit. Yeah, my bad. So my brain's like short circuiting a little bit today. My bad. Sorry about that. I meant Kermit. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And okay, so we've seen the word static before public static, void, main, all of that stuff, string args. So what does that actually mean? Well, we've talked about this void. The void is the return type, main is the name of the actual method. And then um, the string bracket args, this is just to show, this is just a thing that comes along with the main with the main frame, with the main method. And it's supposed to signal like um, th the type of args that takes in something, I forgot. Um, but yeah, so it's like a parameter for this array of string and then args. Okay, essentially, we know all that what all that means. Only thing we do, only two things that we haven't discussed in more detail is public and static. So what exactly does public and static mean? Well, public we'll discuss next time or whenever we get to um, accessors, modifiers, getters, all that good stuff. But static, so static simply means that the attribute or method, because you can have a static method or static attrib attribute, it simply means that it can be used without needing an object and without static an object needs to be created to actually access the attribute or method so i'll show you what that exactly what that looks like so here's this example of a static um example i guess so we have static string this is a static attribute it's a static attribute of type string which is called species and the value for it is fog so we know the species of this class is fog and Static, the thing with static is that when you have a static attribute in a class, every single object of that class is going to have the same static attribute because you don't need a um, object to access this value, which means that the value is constant for every single object of this class. And you can't even access it with the object. So basically it's just the value for this class. That's, it's not linked to the object, it's linked to the class. That's all you need to think about. And then we have the tongue length, the tongue length, it, it can change based on the object. The species can't because they're all frogs. And then we have our print tongue length. This is a non-static method. So we can see that you can just print the tongue length, which might be changing based on object. And then we have our print species. When you print those species, it always prints out frog no matter what, because that's we define that as the, um, the static value, the species of this class. And, we'll, and I think, yeah, let me just, show you guys exactly what that looks like. So we have our static name. We have, let's make a static string species. Okay. And then we have, let's make a 
Okay, I'll, just, I'll actually show you guys a cool thing. Well, not so cool, I guess, but public void print species. And then we can print out the species right here. Yes, and then we can just do Okay. And the better method here is to actually add a static here. So we say public static void, because if you have public static void, that means that you can access this method through the class. Like we've talked about, you don't need to create an object for it. So we can say, oh, system dot out dot, oh, we don't even need to do that. So we can just say log dot print species. And then this prints out the species. Let's print out fog there. So it prints out the name hermit and prints out the fog because we have this line here. I guess we won't print hermit, hermit, but okay. So what if we delete the static here? If we delete the stat static, it would still work. It, we just can't do fog.print species. We would have to do both fog.print species. So now it's specific. It's still fog, but now it's, now we're getting the method from the object, not from the class. Earlier, if we had fog here, this is a class, name of the class. And that's what, that's something what static means. It means that it's the class and it's not the object. So yeah, that's pretty cool. With using static, you can actually keep things constant across objects and using, um, that's essentially how you would want to use static. For example, in robotics, we have multiple instances of say a, um, subsystem. That's what we call code for a shooter or like some kind of intake or arm. And then to code for that, you would want to create a static instance of that. So here we can do, here we can just make a static. Okay, give me a second. Here we can do a static frog. So that means that across every single instance of That means that across every single instance of this example class, Bofog is always going to be um, the same. It doesn't matter. You can't create more example classes and have the Bofog be a different class, essentially. OK, this is getting kind of convoluted. But essentially, if you just use all static, then you're only going to have one instance of each class. And that's the ideal way to do robotics, because you only have one, right? You don't want to. You don't have more than one shooter on your robot. So you want to have static for all your code. So yeah, this is kind of a bad example because our classes here don't function the same way. But moving on from that convoluted example, let's go on to talk about what's the next thing. Okay, yeah, so this is just another going over what we just talked about. To call a static method or to see a static attribute, we don't actually need to create an object to do that. And it's pretty useful in a lot of cases. Notice here that we can say fog that tunnel link. Um, makes the computer mad because ton length isn't a static attribute. So down here, it's not static in ton length, it's just in ton length. So fog.ton length makes the computer extremely mad, yells at us with this angry red underline. So yeah, don't do that. And now we have an exercise, woo. Just add a new static attribute to the re called region to the fog class and then assign it to North America, have the value of it be North America and then create a new static method called print location region and then call it from the main class. Now, ideally, this should print out the region of this um, fog because all fogs, all of these fogs, all bull fogs live in North America, right? I'm not sure that's true, but we'll assume it is for the sake of this exercise. I'll give you guys about five or 10 minutes for that.
Okay, I'm sincerely hoping that was enough time. And then let's just do it now. Okay. A new static attribute called region to file class and then set in North America. And then we create a new static method called print local location region and then call it from the main class. Okay. So going back to the fog, if we just add another static string region equals to North America. Essentially, Hermit lives in the US, so that's why it's North America. And then public static void. Actually, this time, let's not do string, just because. Uh, print region. I guess we can just call it return region now because it doesn't even print it out for us. We have to print it ourselves. We can just return the region. That's pretty simple. And then we can do flag dot return region. Except with this, it's not going to print anything out because we didn't actually tell it to print anything out. It just gives it to us. Okay, so we're going to have to do a system that out oh, that print line. Okay, so if this works, hopefully it does. Yep, it tells us that the species. It's called frog and that it lives in North America. Well, I guess this doesn't actually make sense because not all frogs live in North America. So if we wanted to be more specific, we call this a bow frog. We can call the frog up here, my neighbor. So Herbert's my neighbor, Hermit, not Kermit, I guess. And then essentially here it is, bow frog, North America. And then if we actually want to get fancy, we could say, um, except there's an issue with this and you'll see that here. So both are on a separate line. So to change that, we actually have to change here to print instead of print line because print line inserts a new line after the print line that's printed. So you see now it's both lives in North America and then we can do this. Once again, have it just be print. And boom, you say all bullfrogs live in North America. That's probably not true, but it is what it is. So yeah, that's just a cool co example of how you can manipulate these methods and the turn types to give you what you want, to tell what you want. Okay, constructors. This is a part, this is something that's like super essential to Java. It's a special method of a class that kind of initializes it, it starts it. And you can set the attributes for each object differently for each one with the help of constructors, which is super useful. So essentially that's what this is. And then if you look here, it's a special method. It You say public and then you say the name of the class. So it's public fog. And then you can pass all these parameters in. And usually when you pass parameters into a constructor, you want to use those parameters. You want to use those values and um, set the attributes of this class with them. So you say public frog, and then you pass in the string name. And then down here, we set the tongue length to be 10. So I guess like all frogs have a default, default tongue length of 10, unless you chop it off. So then you can subtract it. And then like we have this name. And the cool thing about this is that, okay, I guess I'll go from this slide. But the cool thing about this is that you have to notice that we actually use this dot name. Now, the reason it's this dot name is because we already pass in the name as a parameter. So name is up here already as a parameter. If we just do, but then it's also the name of this attribute. So we have to do this dot name to show that the attribute of this class is getting set to name. So name is now equal to whatever we pass in here. And up here we passed in Jim. So Jim is the name of this object, this frog. And then um, the reason it's this dot name is because this just shows you that it's this object, like imagine it pointing at itself when it's making itself. I don't know, but yeah, it's this dot name, and then time length is default to be five. I mean ten. Okay, exercise. Please add a constructor to your file class that lets you set the tongue length as well as the name. This is pretty simple. I'm not going to send you the code I had for the last one. So try to write the constructor yourself, and then when you use the constructor, set the tongue length to whatever a parameter is. And then test your method by creating an object with some different values and then print the different val attributes of the objects that you created to show yourself that it actually worked. So create some objects with your custom constructor, pass some values into the constructor, and then print some attributes of the object.
And then I'll give a few minutes for that and then I'll show how to do it.
Okay. I'll just do it now and then, yeah. Okay, so add a constructor that's just a ton link as well as the name and then test it. It's, this is pretty simple. Let's just delete all the stuff so it's not as confusing. So we have a int ton link of the flag. So let's say that's like, oh, we can't find anything. Okay, so, and then we want to make a constructor flag. We want to say um, int, and then I guess we'll just, we can just call it ton length again. This is the whole reason we have the whole this.ton length thing. So this.ton length is equal to ton length. Just to review, this is this.ton length is this part on the left. This is the attribute. This is what this is. This is the attribute on the right here. This is the parameter, the value of the parameter that we passed in. And um, moving on from that, if we have So we can make a new frog of just say, um, frog, I'll name it Kermit, new frog. And then tongue, Kermit's tongue length will be 100 because um, I think his tongue is pretty long probably. And then we can print it out, but to print it out, we've the best practice is probably to use another method. So let's just do void, public void, print tongue. And then we can do, then we can do tongue length, okay. So yeah, so Kermit, let's see how long his tongue is. Uh, print tongue. And that's it. Let us see. It's boom, it's 100, okay. And if we change this, we'll change it to 90. So if someone accidentally cut off the tip of his tongue, it goes down to 90. So you see that using a constructor, we were able to set the value of this attribute inside of the frog class, and then we can print it out. Okay, that's actually the end of my slides, but because I didn't think we get so far, but we'll keep going. And I'll let you guys go like five minutes early. And I just want to cover accessors, a bit of accessors and modifiers. So what that means is, like I said earlier, with these um, with these variables, you don't want to be accessing them directly. So you don't want to just say, oh, permit dot tongue length is equal to 90. You don't want to do that. You, you either set the value of the variable with a constructor, or you set it equal to with a what something called a setter. So that's what does that look like? It's pretty simple. You just have a public has to be public, and we'll discuss why. It can't be private, so it could be public or private. It cannot be private, so it has to be public. And then we'll use public void. Usually setters setters almost hundred percent of the time will be void, and then setter we can do set hung length and this should work and then with setters you always want to give it a parameter which means you always should want to say like oh like a uh, new length so because it's a setter and we'll discuss exactly what that means so and then we can just say tongue length equal to new length and for this one one important thing, thing to notice is that we don't have to say this dot tongue length just saying tongue length is enough because um, the constructor only, there's only confusion about what tongue length is referring to here in the constructor. Down here in the setter, tongue length is pretty simple. Tongue length is the only thing it's looking at is the attribute. So tongue length, you can set it with a setter, set tongue length, and then it sets the new length. Oh, I should not have deleted the print thing. Okay, so public void. Okay, there you go. So this is that. Um, and we can and we can set this. We can just do commit dot set tongue length, and then we can set it to whatever new value we want. So say his tongue got chopped in half. Now it's 50. And then if we want to print it again, there you go. Let's see what it gives us. Good. Now it's 90 and then 50. So yeah, that's a setter for you. Basically with setters, you're modifying what the value of the attributes are. And this is especially important if, because you usually want your values to be private. In, so you put on private name, private string name, private uh, in tongue length. And we'll discuss exactly what private means again next week, because I don't think we have enough time for that. And 
because if it's because it's private, you can't actually access it outside of this class. That's part of what private is. So it's like, so we can't do commit dot tongue link. It doesn't show up anymore. So this gives us an issue because it is we can't see the tongue length, right? Because it's private. So someone might want to keep their tongue length uh, private because security reasons, privacy reasons, all of that stuff. So to actually set it, you want to do print tongue length. And then with a getter, I mean, not print tongue length, you want to do set tongue length. And then with a getter, so this is a, this is called a setter, setter. And then here we have a getter. So we have, we can, it's the same thing again, public. This time it'll also be, um, this time it won't be void actually because you need to return it. So getters always return something and you can just do um, get tongue length and that should be good. And we'll just do return tongue length. And boom, there you go. So now instead of, now we can actually get rid of print tongue length, print tongue. And this time, instead of we want to print it out, we can just say, uh, okay, so now we can say, send the out print line and then commit get the tongue length. So you can just print it out by doing that. And that's better most of the time than just having a print method from the class itself because you want control over whatever that name, whatever the tongue length is, right? That value, how long it is. So yeah, there you go. That's your getters and setters. It's pretty, uh, getters and setters are pretty simple. Oh, what did I do? Oh, here, I don't know what that's for. I don't know what when I inputted that actually. I think I just clicked this click something. So yeah, there you go. It starts off constructing it with a tongue length of 90. And then we get it and it's 90. So we print it out and then we get and then we set it to 50 and then we get it again and we print it out and it's 50. So yeah, I'll send all this code in the chat in case you actually want to take a look at it. And yeah, that's basically it for today. We're done with session session seven. Next week, we'll do some more complex stuff regarding object-oriented programming and potentially do a project again. And yeah, that's it. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Good night, guys.